Hello, welcome to Grace Church uh, Weekend Experience. My name is Greg Foote. I'm the pastor of Family Ministries here at Grace, and I wanna welcome you to this experience. And one of the cool things is we're gonna sit back and relax. We're gonna do some worship together. We're gonna watch a message, and we're gonna continue our series on Daniel called Living uh, in Exile. And so make sure you uh, sit back and enjoy it. Thank you so much for joining us. Everybody, welcome to Grace. We're so glad that you're joining us for our online weekend experience. Let's sing together. You are the only king forever, mighty God. 
2 Corinthians 1, chapter 1, verses 18 through 22 say, But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it was, has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to God, to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both of both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Other kindness you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Yes, and amen. All your promises 
Well guys, hello, my name is Aiden, one of the pastors here uh, at Grace. I'm glad that you guys are with us online. And so if you are here and you're part of the Grace family, uh, we miss seeing you, but glad that we can connect uh, in this unique way during these unique times. And if you are someone who's maybe newer uh, to Grace or Grace Online, um, we're glad that you're here. We hope that this is just uh, in a unique way that these online uh, services feel at home. You know, I hope it feels like home while you're at home. We're in this series called Living in Exile. And that idea of exile is is not like a word that we use all the time. I think Taylor Swift has a new song that has that in the title, but it's not a, it's not a term that we use often, right? But it's this idea of someone who is forced away from their home, who has to leave their home, uh, usually by force to another country for a prolonged amount of time, right? I think the most clear example of this that we see in cartoon history is the Lion Simba. Right, like in Lion King, Simba is exiled from his home, right? Like he is heir to the throne. He has this uh, royal identity, yet his uncle uh, kind of outcasts him, kind of sends him away as an exile to like a very colorful jungle with a couple rodents that eat a lot of bugs, right? And so he kind of lives away from his home in exile, right? And that is the story of Daniel. As we go through this series of Living in Exile, we're looking at the story of Daniel and his three friends as they live as exiles. But how as they live as exiles, they're faithful to the Lord in this foreign nation that they're in, which is opposed to God, Babylon, right? It's this this historical kingdom that is opposed to God where Daniel and his friends find himself, right? That Babylon was a historical place, but it also becomes this kind of prototype, this kind of metaphor through scripture of a culture that's opposed to God. We see this at the Tower of Babel, right? In Genesis, right? Go check it out. We kind of see these people are opposed to God, right? But we, what scripture shows us is that as believers, if you are listening, you're a follower of Jesus living in America in 2020, you also are in exile. We see that in the book of First Peter. We see that through scripture. A guy named John Piper, we'll throw this on the screen. He kind of kind of pulls together a lot of different references in the New Testament to the church about how we see ourselves. He says this, in a profound sense, this world is not our home. When we are away from our bodies, we will be at home with the Lord. We are exiles and we are strangers here. The fact that we are exiles on earth does not mean that we don't care about what becomes of culture. However, it does mean that we exert our influence as very happy, broken-hearted outsiders. We are exiles. Our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we have no lasting city, but we seek a city that is to come. That, that, that tension that Daniel lived in, that as they live in Babylon, as they're following the ways of the Lord, is the same tension that we live in, right? How do we live in this modern culture? How do we live in the world that we live in, yet stay faithful to what God has called us to without conforming or compromising, right? Live, living in the tension is hard. Like you can think of times that we've all in one way or another had to live in some kind of attention or experience these tensions, right? I, uh, when I was in high school, I was a, I, I was, I've always been a cautious bad driver. Like I drive today like a 15 year old who just got their temps. Like I'm not, I'm not a good driver, right? My friends who drive with me will say that. I'm always like trying not to hit mailboxes. I live a mile from where I work and so I don't, I don't drive very much. I haven't been on the highway in years. That's not true, but I'm, but I'm not a good driver, right? And so I'm always real cautious of all these driving laws and speeding and all these things. When I was in high school, when I was like 16 years old, I was, it's first year I could drive to school and my parents were pretty, you know, they were cool, but they were real careful about driving rules. And so there was this law at the time that if you were, you just got your license, you can only have one person in your car until you were like 18 or something. I don't even know if that's a real law. My parents might've made it up just for me to be careful, but that was a rule. You can only have one person in your car uh, until you're 18. And so I'm leaving school one day. I'm leaving high school, getting in my car, I'm going to leave, I'm like the last person to leave. And as I'm leaving, there's these two pretty girls that are like waving me down, right? They're like, hey, hey, they wave me down. And so I pull over and they're like, hey, our ride didn't pick us up. Would you be able to drop us off at our house? And I had known these girls, like whatever. And they're like, can you drop us off at our house? And I'm like, oh no, I am in the tension. I can only have one. Maybe I could drive you each to your house one at a time. Like I can only have one of them, right? And I'm pretty sure that like they lived on the way to my house. Like my house was like a mile away and their house was like, like I had to pass their house to get to mine. <laughs> and as a high schooler, I looked at these girls and I'm like, 
I'm sorry, my mom said I could only have one person in the car, and I went home. I can still picture, I can still picture myself like, what are you doing? And driving off and seeing these two girls just standing on the sidewalk, like confused, right? Lived in this tension, what do I do with this? Now, one of those girls is now my wife, and so it worked out, it figured itself out. But we have to learn to live in this tension, right? And what's interesting is that before God allows these four nations to come and take his people, before Daniel and his friends go into exile, he writes something to these exiles in the book of Jeremiah. We'll throw it on the screen. He says this. This is, this is how he wants them to live. He gives them instructions while they're living in exile, while they're living in Babylon. Jeremiah 29 says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those that I have carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Verse 7 says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which you have been carried into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. That this, that as they're called into exile, they're not called to isolate or to separate, to, to fight back or to be hostile towards the culture that they find themselves in. They're not called to that. But at the same time, they're not called to just become one of the culture, to assimilate, to, to imitate it and just say, while in Babylon, we'll just do what the Babylonians do, right? He calls them to live in this tension of, of loving where they find themselves, to serving it, to seeking the peace of this foreign culture that is opposed to God, while at the same time being faithful. And so that is where we have found ourselves today. So we are gonna jump in to chapter two. Chapter two of the book of Daniel. It's this big, crazy story that involves big statues made of lots of different materials, crazy dreams, a king who wants to kill people. Like it's a crazy, it's a crazy story. If you're not familiar with the Old Testament, you see old names, you see these old countries, and it can be easy to zone out, I encourage you to stick with me in this crazy story today, all right? Chapter two, if you have a Bible with you, I would encourage you to read along through it. It's gonna be easier if you track that way. If you got your phone in your hand, Bible app, uh, open that and we'll jump into this today. Last week, uh, Pastor Dan, he does a good job, I'm thinking of hiring him someday, work for me. He, he opened uh, us up in chapter one and, and kind of painted the picture that these guys, these exiles at one time lived in Judah, southern kingdom of Israel. Babylon comes in, God allows them because the people of God constantly turn their backs. He allows these four nations to come and take them into exile. And so we find Daniel uh, and his friends, these were smart, young, 15 year old guys who find themselves in the hands of a foreign captor, right? And they find themselves in the courts of this king because they stole the, the most wise, smart, good looking guys they could. And what they want to do is they want to indoctrinate them into the ways of Babylon, right? And so we see in chapter one, these guys are kind of going through this process of becoming Babylonians, right? New names, new clothes. And what they're trying to do is get them to do what the Babylonians do. But we see that Daniel and his friends don't compromise. They don't defile themselves while they're put to the test. They peacefully resist uh, to defile themselves and they end up uh, being promoted in this kingdom, right? Promoted to a pretty high place uh, within the king's courts. So we find ourselves then in chapter two. We are going to jump into this. Are you with me? We'll put it on the TV. Ride with me here as we go through this crazy story. Chapter two. This is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. We'll call him Nebi. Uh, this is a dream he has. It says, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it is. Have you ever had this? You know where you have a dream and you wake up and it feels so real? And it was like you went on some crazy adventure or you could like fly or something crazy. Or sometimes you have dreams and you wake up, you're like, oh gosh, please tell me that wasn't real. Like you wake up from this, from a, a crazy dream, like that's what happens. King wakes up on the wrong side of the bed, right? So he calls all these guys together to tell him what his dream means. And all these astrologers, magic people come together. They say, may the king live forever. Tell us about your dream. But look at what the king says. He says in verse five, the king replied to the astrologers, this is what I firmly decided. If you do not tell me first what my dream was and then interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your house is turned into piles of rubble. <laughs> like, that's a, that's a harsh work environment, right? Like these guys are like, tell us your dream king and we'll tell you what it means. He's like, no, if you guys are the real deal, you will tell me what I dreamed 
and then you'll tell me what it means. Guys, this is like when your girl's mad at you. When your girl's mad at you and you're like, girl, why are you, what, baby, why are you mad? And she says, I want you to find out why I'm mad. <laughs> and then I want you to fix it. Like, you know, that's kind of what the king's not going, it's a little harsher consequences, right? The king's like, if you don't tell me my dream is to interpret it, we will chop you up, burn your house down. You're like, bro, he's, he's what the kids call hashtag extra, right? He goes a little crazy. Verse 10, we'll pick up at verse 10. The astrologers, all these magicians, they answer the king. There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great, mighty, has ever asked such an insane thing to any of us. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it except the gods. And they don't live among humans. Like, they don't live here. Like, no one, this is crazy what you're asking, right? And this ticked the king off in verse 12. It's made the king so angry, so furious, that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon, which David and his friends fall in that category. He wants all the wise men dead because they couldn't tell him his dream, right? So this decree was issued and put out that all the wise men should be put to death. And so men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends. Are you following the story? So Daniel and his friends are off somewhere. I have no idea what's going on. Probably playing pool. And look what happens next. Verse 14. When Arioch, he's a commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put, the, put to death the wise men of Babylon, he comes and he finds Daniel. And look what it says. Daniel spoke to him with wisdom intact. Underline that. We're going to circle back to that. Daniel asks the king, king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? He's like, what is going on, right? Daniel's like, hold up. Why is this happening, right? And then the, the commander explained this matter to Daniel. And in response, Daniel goes to the king. He goes to the king and he asks for more time, which other, the other guys have already done. They've asked for more time. The king said no. Daniel goes, asks for more time, and the king gives it to him. Are you tracking with me? Daniel comes back to his house. He, his, his three friends are there, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. He's there and he urges them. He urges them, verse 18, to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. Like they don't just slough it off. They're not like a crazy king's a psycho. They come back and they're like, we got to plead before the Lord that we might not be executed with all the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And what happens is amazing. During the night, God reveals the king's dream to Daniel. He reveals the mystery to Daniel, right? And we see what happens uh, in verse 20. It says, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells in him. I thank you and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known the king's dream. If you're reading in your Bible, you see that this is formatted different. What happens is that God reveals this mystery. He reveals the king's dream to Daniel. And Daniel breaks out in song. Like this is formatted differently because it's a song that's in the middle of this chapter. And I encourage you to do this. When you read in scripture, if you see whether, this is all through scripture, there's whole books about songs. You'll see this in the, early in the book of Samuel. You'll see this uh, in the book of Luke. There'll be these songs. And these songs are a central theme of what's going on. So as you read this, we see him praising God for his reign and for his revelation, right? Like he's praising God. Like Daniel and his brain is, is in Babylon. The, ki the savage king of the world who can just have a bad dream and kill everyone is the boss, right? And Daniel pleads, he's scared, he pleads before the Lord and the Lord shows him this mystery and it reminds Daniel of who is really in charge. And so Daniel breaks out in song of praise to God, right? And then what we see next, we'll jump to verse 26. Daniel goes to interpret this dream to the king. Verse 26. King asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, is Daniel's Babylonian name, which he never uses. He says, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream? Are you able to tell me? And Daniel replied, look at this, verse 27. He replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king this mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come through your dream and these visions that pass through your mind. What Daniel said, the king's like, can you tell me my dream? And Daniel's like, I can't. 
None of these fools can, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Like Daniel's very clear, like this ain't me, this ain't them, this is the Lord, right? And then Daniel goes on to tell them his dream. And it is this, we're not gonna, we won't throw it up on the screen, but he tells them this dream of this big dazzling statue. And it's got this gold head and it's made of all these different materials of iron and of bronze and of silver and of clay. And he tells the story of this big, beautiful statue, right? That like kind of everybody's attracted to this big statue. But look at verse 34, jump to verse 34. As the king was looking at the statue, a rock was cut out. This is obscure, just track with me. This rock was cut out, but it wasn't cut out by human hands. And it struck the statue on its feet and it smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, bronze, all these materials became like broken pieces, became like dust, chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But that rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. So that's the king's dream. That's the dream he has. Big statue made of a bunch of different stuff. A rock comes out of nowhere and destroys it. That's the dream. And then Daniel interprets the dream. He says, this was the dream and now we will interpret it. Verse 37, Daniel says, he's talking to King Nebuchadnezzar now. Your majesty, you are the king of kings, Daniel says. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. 38 says, in your hands, he has placed all mankind, beasts of the field, birds of the sky, wherever they live, he has made you the ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. The statue had a head of gold. And he says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. Now you might be scratching your head on why God would have Daniel say that to Nebuchadnezzar, but you also may say, that sounds vaguely familiar. If it sounds vaguely familiar, it's because we see it in Genesis 1. We'll throw that on the screen. But in Genesis 1, when God creates man, He says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, birds of the sky, over the livestock, and over all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. What we see is Daniel goes to tell this dream to the king. He is referencing Genesis 1. He's referencing that rule that we are given as humans. Why? Because the story of scripture, the beginning of the story in Genesis, is that God creates mankind in his image, that we are made to rule and reign over creation alongside God, that we are called to to have dominion over the earth and and to help it to flourish, right? But what do we see in Genesis 1? That in our pride and our arrogance, we turned our back on God and we wanna do things our way. And that becomes this pattern throughout scripture of humans grasping power for ourselves, turning our back. We see this in the kingdom of Israel. This is why they're exiled. They turn their backs on God. They can do it themselves. And it always rolls downhill and does not go well. As Daniel starts to interpret this dream, he starts with that. He says, King, God has given you dominion and power over all these things. He wants you to rule and to flourish the earth. But we know that this king wakes up grumpy, wants to kill people, wants absolute power, and we see what happens. And so he goes on to interpret this dream. And in this dream, it's obscure that all these different materials, the bronze and the silver and the iron and the clay, they all represent these different kingdoms. Traditionally, it's believed that these kingdoms represent Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. That's, that's what the kind of traditional belief is. There's some different disagreement. doesn't matter. That's what we call the weeds. The point is, that all these kingdoms in his dream, one after one, rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall, until we get to verse 44. And verse 44 says this, In the time of all those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and it will bring to an end but it itself will endure forever. That is the meaning of that rock cut out of the mountain, not by human hands, a rock that broke all these materials to pieces. He says, that's a dream. That's a dream. This rock that's gonna crush the statue and make it nothing is this kingdom that God is gonna set up that will endure forever. So Daniel tells the king this dream and the king responds. He falls down on his face. He gives Daniel gifts and he raises Daniel and his friends to even a higher position within the government. It's a crazy story. It's a good story, right? Like I was gonna make that like a film, right? That was great. What 
What in the world does that story have to do with you and me as exiles today, 2020 in America? Like, what, what is this dream of statues and mad kings and weird names and gold and bronze? What does it have to do with us? There's just a couple things I want to take a look at. That as we look at this story, as we look at the life of Daniel, that we as modern day exiles, as people who, whose home is away from this earth, whose home is the kingdom of Jesus, what does that mean from us? I just want to pull out a couple different things. As exiles, as we look at this story, we see that as exiles, you and I, we must navigate our culture with wisdom intact. We see that in verse in verse 14 when these when the guys are coming to kill Daniel for no reason, this unreasonable thing. It says that Daniel, when he when he came to put them to death, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom intact. I think that's fascinating. Tact is this sensitivity in dealing with others, in dealing with the difficult issues, right? Daniel, he had wisdom and tact in the face of someone who is extremely unreasonable. Maybe someone is going to come chop you up into pieces and burn your house down, but maybe you, you can relate to someone who's unreasonable in your life, right? Someone with a lot of power, someone who could easily destroy his life. Daniel doesn't respond. He responds with wisdom and tact, right? And how does he do that? I think we see a couple simple things that are just interesting. When they come and say, we're killing you because of your job, Daniel, he responds with this intact by saying, why did the king issue this decree? Like, he responds with a question. He responds, he seeks to understand what's going on, right? That Daniel maintains his humble confidence. He goes and approaches the king. He's like, I'm going to go talk to the king. You're like, Ugh. Like, if someone's coming to kill you, you're like, let me go talk to him. Right? He has this humble confidence in the Lord. We see that Daniel doesn't punch back, right? He hasn't summoned down fire, right? And it asks us, as, as exiles living here, do we walk through situations? Do we deal with people, our culture, news, global events? Do we respond with wisdom intact? Do we seek to understand when different things come our way, different trials, different things we disagree with? Do we seek to understand? Dan just said this a couple weeks ago, but sometimes, you know, we can hear something, we can read something, we can watch a YouTube video, read an article or whatever it is, and we want to, we, we see this point that was made. And so we want to tell everybody this point. We want to make this point, make sure everybody knows about this point. And in the midst of that, we fail to make a difference, right? When we seek to understand we can make more of a difference if we seek just to make a point, right? We see that in the story of Daniel. Do we operate as Daniel did from a place of humility? Or do we walk around in every situation acting like we own the place? But Daniel had this, this peaceful, hum, confident humility, right? As he interacted with these people. We see Daniel responding with tact, but also with wisdom. I, I would love to sit here and do a whole sermon series on wisdom, right? I am not yet 30. I'm a young fella and I'm telling you, what our culture lacks and what we so desire is wisdom. We want wisdom. It's where experience and knowledge and gentleness, discernment, sound judgment all come together, right? And it is, it is, not, it is a rare thing in our world to find someone with wisdom. That's why we love people like Yoda. That's why we love people like Master Splinter from Ninja Turtles. That's why we love Rafiki. That's why we love Mr. Miyagi because they have this wisdom, right? These characters give and portray this wisdom. And all through the book of Daniel, not just chapter two, but from one to seven, we see this wisdom play out from these guys, right? We see this wisdom play out. And I wholeheartedly believe that we, we as, a, as a culture are hungry for this. We lack this in hard situations. I think it would change our public dialogue, the scripture from cover to cover talk about this. The exiles, as exiles, we have the opportunity to offer it. Daniel possessed it, and that is godly wisdom. It's godly wisdom. Here's the truth, my friends. We are in an age of information. If you want to go figure out how to build a chair out of styrofoam and bread, you can YouTube it and you can find out how to do it. Like, we have no shortage of information, right? Like, you can find out every useless fact you ever wanted to from YouTube, Google, podcasts, any information. But what we lack as a culture, what we lack as Christians oftentimes, is we lack wisdom. 
godly wisdom to navigate the gray of our world, to navigate the Babylon that we live in, right? And to add to the confusion, God's wisdom doesn't always look like our worldly wisdom, right? God's wisdom can be foolish sounding at times. I encourage you to write it down, go back and read it later. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, it's an awesome chapter. The letter Paul writes, but verse 25, it says, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. God's wisdom is different than our wisdom. God's wisdom doesn't say get rich or die trying. God's wisdom doesn't say be the best you can be at at whatever cost, right? God's wisdom oftentimes looks like losing. We see that at the cross. In God's wisdom, all through the scripture, he uses weak, broken people to accomplish his goals, right? We see in God's wisdom that there's this upside down kingdom of loving enemies and losing your life to find your life and that these different broken people are the ones who are truly blessed, right? We see that in God's wisdom, things move slow. They aren't microwaved, right? In the Proverbs, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we see that Daniel operated from a, a reverent love, fear, respect of the Lord, not of the king. He didn't fear Babylon. He didn't fear death. But he honored them as he feared the Lord, right? Do we, as exiles, as Christians, followers of Jesus, living in America in 2020, do we operate from a place of wisdom or are we reactive? I think it's worth asking ourselves. What we see from this story, what this story shows us, what the story tells us that as exiles, we are not home. This is not our home. Daniel and his friends, Daniel and company knew that Babylon never was and never was going to be the true home that they longed for. Daniel lived his whole lifetime there. He was brought there at 15 as a kid. And when he finds himself in a lion's den decades later, he's an old man. Like he lives his whole life in Babylon, but he never got too cozy. He never got too comfortable. And he wasn't surprised when Babylon acted like Babylon. He wasn't like, oh my gosh, what is going on? He knew he wasn't home. He knew that was the situation. Some of us guys, listen, I, I, I want, I so badly want to, want to talk with wisdom intact. And I I get it. Like, I'm a 30-year-old guy. You know, I I get it. He probably doesn't know all the facts. I get it. I want to talk with wisdom intact because I believe there's so much in this passage, so much in the story of Daniel that is so important for every single one of us as followers of Jesus. Because many of us are very distraught. We have conversations with you. You post it on Facebook. We're very distraught, right? Because at one time, whether it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50, whatever it was, at one time, our culture might have looked a little bit different and we thought that it was home. We're like, oh, this is, this is how everything should be. This is home. And then some things change, some different things develop, some different ways of life come as, as time goes on and, we're like, and we get uncomfortable. And we're like, whoa, 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 this ain't, this ain't home anymore. And we freak out and we respond because we're like, whoa, 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 now we're in Babylon. We weren't in Babylon then, but now we are. That is not the case, my friends. We have never been home. It wasn't home 50 years ago, and it's not going to be home in 50 years. We are in Babylon. We live in a culture that's opposed to the way of God, right? And if we're honest with ourselves, if, if, if Babylon, if this world was our home, somewhere along the line, we have compromised. Somewhere along the line we've compromised, whether it's out in the open or hidden in secret, somewhere we compromise if we think that this was our home, right? And the truth is we aren't called to make Babylon, make this world our true home. It's not what we're called to do. We're called to seek its peace. We're called to serve and love the culture as as exiles, right? But sometimes I'm scared that myself included that we fall in love with this world and we will fight tooth and nail, post tooth and nail to make this world our forever home. And it's not and it never will be. And it wasn't. Some of us are distraught because living in the tension is just hard. It's just hard, right? And what ends up happening and this is what happened with a lot of the people in Israel is they just became part of the culture. They just became part of Babylon. 
And they told themselves, you know what? God's kingdom, God's ways, and the ways of Babylon, they're, they're really not that different. So they compromise, they shift until the two look like the same thing in our minds, right? See so that maybe in our culture we tell ourselves, like, you know what, our culture, the things that we want, the norms, what we're shooting for, and what Jesus calls us to are kind of the same thing. And so we compromise, right? We try to be the most cool, hip, socially acceptable exiles we can be, right? And in the process, we turn into the culture that we are surrounded by. We eat the meat, we bow to the statue, and whether it's out of fear, doubt, or boredom, we give up our practices and we just do what the Babylonians do. And I ask myself, like, how does that happen? Because we all experience that, right? Like I'm preaching with you this morning. How does that happen? It's no surprise that if I've got some news station on 24 seven, if I'm listening to some certain podcast or wherever these people may fall all the time, if we put everything through just a, a certain type of just worldly activist lens, and that is just what, the lens that everything goes through, whatever the lens is, if we are filling ourselves with news and podcasts and voices all the time, what do you think is gonna happen? Like I, for myself, there was a time period where different podcasts, different kind of speakers I listened to often, they, they weren't saying anything inherently bad. Good stuff, sure, very practical stuff. They're very smart people. I listen to it all the time, all the time. And what I realized was I am becoming disciples of these things. Who are you following? Who are you becoming a disciple of? We end up looking like Babylon and compromising somewhere because we are filling our hearts and our minds and our time and our conversations with things that are not the wisdom of God. Check your phone. Check your YouTube hours. Check, turn the TV off so that you might hear the wisdom of God. For some of us, we, we live in this world where we want peace, we want love, we want acceptance. We want all the benefits of a true home with the true king, yet we want it on Babylon's terms. And what a guy named Mark Sayer says is that we want the kingdom without the king. We want all the benefits of Jesus, but we don't want Jesus. We want all the things that he brings, truth and peace and love and identity, but we don't want him to do it. We just want the benefits. We want the kingdom without the king, right? Which leads us to this, that as what we see in this story, what we see in this crazy dream that Daniel interprets, this rock that comes and smashes. As exiles, we don't believe in earthly kings, we believe in the kingdom. Stole that from Chance the Rapper lyric. But we don't believe in earthly kings, we believe in the kingdom. Psalm 146 says this, don't put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that day, they become nothing. But blessed are those whose help and hope is in the Lord their God, right? Don't put your trust in people on TV, in people on blog. Don't put your trust in these humanly people. They fail. This whole dream that Daniel interprets and gives this world power king is that all oh, these kingdoms are going to come and fall, going to come and fall, and this rock this kingdom of God that will endure forever is gonna smash all them. Look back at verse 44. We'll throw it up here on the screen. Verse 44, this is Daniel's interpretation of the dream. He says, in the time of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and it will bring them to an end, but it itself will endure forever. We hear about this kingdom later on in scripture. We hear about this kingdom in the book of Luke when an angel comes and talks to a teenage girl and says, don't be afraid for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You should call him Jesus. He will be great son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and his kingdom will never end. Guys, this is where the power of the story, the power of this dream, this obscure dream, this is where this all comes together, where God's reign, his wisdom, his revelation, our response, his exiles all come together. What we see in this big story of the scripture, that this rock in this dream that was cut out by human hands that comes and demolishes all other kingdoms is the kingdom of Jesus. Jesus is that rock. He is the cornerstone of our faith, 
He is the foundation of our salvation. He is the rock in the desert that was split and poured out for his people. Exodus 17, 1 Corinthians 10, go read it. Jesus is this rock. There's a point in New Testament, in the book of Luke, where Jesus is kind of going back and forth with the Pharisees. They're getting ticked at him. And what Jesus, he references Daniel. He says, everyone who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone who falls on it will be crushed. And Jesus is talking about himself and his kingdom. This dream Daniel interprets is a picture of Jesus, this rock that destroys all kingdoms and lasts forever. The kingdom of Jesus has begun. It will be actualized in eternity, but it is not a future thing. The kingdom of Jesus is a right now thing. John the Baptist was preparing the way in the wilderness as Jesus came and he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It has come near. It has started, right? But it begs the question, it begs the question, how does Jesus bring his kingdom? How does it, how does it come? How does this rock come? Because listen, if you are someone at the time of Jesus and your people were brought into exile hundreds of years ago, and you have been living under the thumb of kingdom after kingdom after dictator after dictator, and you've been living in this situation oppressed and, and deprived of your homeland, and this, this rock is gonna come, this king is gonna come, you're like, I got some ideas of how he can come. You may be a Christian today, you're like, I got some ideas of how we should do this situation. How does he bring his kingdom? Colossians 2. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them. How? Triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus is the rock that comes and destroys all these kingdoms of earth, all these literal and metaphorical Babylons, but he doesn't do it how we think he should do it. He wears a crown, but it's a crown of thorns. That he wears this royal robe, but it's thrown on him in, in jest. They're making fun of him as they cover him in this robe. He's lifted up before his people, but it's not on a throne. It's on a cross to die and give his life for his people. That is how his kingdom comes. It's not what we wanted. It's not what we expected. But listen, God's wisdom doesn't always look like our wisdom, does it? God's wisdom looks different. Babylon comes with the sword but Jesus comes with the cross. Babylon shows its power by taking life. Jesus shows his power by laying down his life. Babylon builds big statues to flex their authority, yet Jesus heals the sick and broken to show his authority. Babylon is full of itself. Jesus emptied himself. Babylon comes with force, but Jesus comes with an invitation. What kingdom are you a citizen of? What kingdom are you a citizen of? I think as we look at this story, as we talk about being exiles, as we talk about these people who live in this different land, as we see ourselves this different way, I gotta ask us, how do you see yourself? How do you see the culture, the country, the world that you live in? How do you see the people around you? If your primary identity is an American, a Democrat, a Republican, an activist, someone who's just trying to have a good time while we're here. Those things aren't inherently bad. But if they're our primary identity, if they are how we see ourselves, we're gonna end up off course. If we see the people around us just in terms of closed-minded or woke, or that person's stupid, that person's uninformed, they're an obstacle to my life, we're gonna end up off course. If we see ourselves and the people around us in the world that we live in this way, we may be living from a different story than the story that God would have us live. Because the world that we're in is telling us a story. There's this narrative of the culture. It's based on individualism. It's based on power. It's based on your personal happiness. It's based on us maintaining control. And if we can accomplish, do these certain things, however that looks, then we'll be happy. That's not the story of God. The story of the gospel is completely different. 
that from cover to cover, God has created all things. He's created us to have relationship with him. We broke that, we destroyed that, and we see his story of redemption and salvation, his wisdom playing out in unlikely ways. We see God showing up as a man, Jesus, God, Emmanuel, under one of these kingdoms, under Roman rule, living in the tension laying his life down, being killed by the authorities, the religious authorities, the the kingdom authorities, dies, raises again, calls his people to live in this kingdom that he is bringing, this kingdom of self-sacrifice, of grace, of forgiveness, of peace, of laying down our rights and our power for the sake of others, and that we find our identity, our hope, our assurance in that story. We are invited into that story. What story are you part of? What story are you living your life from? Because when we see ourselves as exiles here in Jesus' kingdom as our home, we will live differently. My friends, we, we have to see our world, see ourselves differently. We have to see ourselves. If you are a follower of Jesus, we've got to put on a different lens. We cannot keep having conversations, Babylon conversations, reducing everything down to, to parties or certain, certain cultural systems. We have to see things different. When I was a kid, you would get a cereal box and inside that cereal box would be these glasses, 3D glasses, a blue lens and a red lens. And you'd put them on, they were wonky, and on the back of that box was a picture. And sure, the picture, if you put the glasses on, you could see some things clear. You could see some things pop, you could see these different things with these glasses on. Sure, it was like, all right, I see it. But if I wore those glasses to drive and to go to work and to preach and to play with my kids, if I wore these glasses and saw everything through these glasses, everything will be discolored, it'll be distorted, it won't look right. We have to take off our cultural lenses. We have to take out these lenses that that put everything into red or blue, that put everything into these different cultural stereotypes, and we have to see this bigger picture. This rock that comes, comes, comes from far away. It raises the bar on the conversation. My friends, we as followers of Jesus, you, me, we have to, in our conversations, in the things that we hear, and the things that we talk about, and the things that work us up, we have to take these things and not just put them into different colored buckets, blue buckets, red buckets, Democrat buckets, Republican buckets, we have to stop doing that. We have to take every situation and we have to do what scripture says is to take everything captive and submit it to Christ. We submit all these things to the rule and the reign, the revelation and the wisdom of a God who is outside of our cultural Babylon and submit them to the kingdom of God. Will you guys pray with me today? God, we are so thankful that you are greater than the kingdoms of this earth. That your rule and reign does not end and yet God, you bring your kingdom in an unlikely way that you come to us with an invitation and you call us to go forth with that invitation. And so God, I pray, I pray for us as Grace Church live and online that we might respond to your kingdom, that we might put on a gospel lens and take off our cultural lenses, take off our Republican lens, our Democrat lens, our social activist lens, whatever the lens that we see the world through, that we might see people in your kingdom through a gospel lens lens, that we might submit every thought to Christ. Jesus, we are thankful for this ancient story of Daniel, of living in exile and being faithful to what you've called them to. I pray that we might see ourselves that way, and we trust that you are with us and that your kingdom is at hand as you lead us. It is because of Christ we pray. Amen. That was a great challenge today from Pastor Aiden going through Daniel chapter 2. And I encourage you to uh, take what you learned and share that with people you come in contact with. So not just keep it to yourself, but share your notes or just share what you learned to your coworkers, your family and friends. And I encourage you just to, to grow in your faith that way. 
One of the things about Grace Church is we live to give, and this week we are giving to our community. So this Saturday, October 31st, we are doing Fall Fest on Wheels. You heard that right. We're doing Fall Fest in cars. It's going to be a drive through experience. And so I encourage you to join us. Maybe you just checked us out online, having a chance to join us in person, but this would be a great opportunity. I was socially distant and all that stuff to get your kids in the car, load up the vans, free candy. Um, we're going to give lunch. It's going to be awesome. And uh, so I encourage you to, to be a part of that uh, this uh, this weekend, October 31st. And again, I want to say thank you so much for many of you who give sacrificially here to the movement of Grace Church. And so you can do that in multiple ways on, on our Grace Church app, or you can text to give. But by doing that, we have a chance to do ministries like the uh, the Fall Fest on Wheels. So thank you so much for many of you who uh, give to the ministry of Grace Church. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us, and have a great one as well as the message. We're going to continue our conver series, conver series, our conversation. Good job, good job, good job. Thanks for joining us.